Any Percy Jackson or mythology fans in your family? Stay tuned as we talk about Greece. Welcome to Vacation Mavens, a family travel podcast with ideas for your next vacation and tips to get you out the door. Here are your hosts, Kim from Stuffed Suitcase and Tamara from We Three Travel. So Tamara, we are back chatting again after seeing each other IRL, as text lingo- language would be, right? <laughs> In real life. <laughs> yeah, did it. You're not tired of talking to me yet? <laughs> no, uh, we actually had to force ourselves to go to sleep one day because I was getting tired, but we could have sat there on the beds just talking the rest of the evening until you had to leave in the morning, right? Yeah, it was <laughs> so fun. Yeah, It's always nice when we get to see each other in person, but I'm glad that at least I get to talk to you every week. Yeah, it makes it nice. And I had my first taste of, you know, commuter Amtrak train service with you, thanks to you, from New York City to Philadelphia. So that was kind of fun. You're such a pro now. I mean, now (laughs) you know how to fly into JFK, take the, what do you take, the air train, and then the Long Island Railroad, Penn Station, and then you find your way to the hotel. You've even taken the train, what, did you take New Jersey Transit out to uh, Newark I did. You're right. You are a pro. Well, all because of you. I actually, you know, New York City is actually a really easy city to understand once you're on Manhattan, like on the island. I don't know anything about all the burbs and the sure. neighborhoods outside of that. But once I'm on the island, I'm like, oh, I, I kind of know what I'm doing here. <laughs> See, and it's only a year ago that you were there for the first time. I know. It's fun. It's it's good. I still, though, I will say that the subway still overwhelms me a bit because, like, there's just so many tracks and knowing uptown, downtown and then it's like Bronx sometimes gets in there and but and you're going, wait, which direction am I, am I going? So yeah, that's the one thing is sometimes knowing like which train to hop on and which track to be at. That's the only the subway that's can be I, a little overwhelming still. I feel like when we've traveled, I really tried to teach Hannah like how to read a metro or a subway map, you know, because really it's like if you, you always have to look at the end point because yeah. it's going to say like, you know, it's not going to say northbound. It'll usually just say like the end point. And yeah. so you have to know what that is and then, you know, figure out the stops know, along the way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Make sure it's how, not a yeah. not a direct or something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like an express. Express, so. thank you. I was like, whatever that term is. Good but yeah, there. so we had we had a couple of days. You and I were in town. We should tell the listeners why we were there. But we went to New York for the International Media Marketplace, which is a chance for us to meet with about 20 different destinations, just back-to-back meetings all day. So it's really intense learning about a lot of different destinations that we might want to visit in the next year or two and hearing what's new at some of the ones that we've already been to. And then uh, the New York Times travel show is the next day. So we popped into there for a little bit to hear a presentation from Visit California. So that's that's kind of why we were there. Now, I know you had a purpose when you were there. You <laughs> had your certain people that you wanted to meet with. So what was your agenda? Well, we finally, thanks to you, I finally nailed down that we are going to decide to do a uh, West Coast road trip. And that also helps make sure that we can travel for spring break, but also get our kitchen done without, you know, totally breaking the bank. So we are doing a West Coast California road trip. And so my point when I saw how many California destinations were there was just to, you know, kind of reconfirm meetings with a lot of those people. I've worked with them before, of course, but also find new little places that I haven't been yet and try and think of if someone's coming from Seattle and they're headed down to, you know, maybe Southern California, Disneyland type area, what stops along the way would they want to visit along the way and kind of talk to those guys because that's what we're going to be doing. And so I had a lot of fun meeting with different destinations. And then Did I also have any that oh, you like just learned about and that you really now you definitely want to add to your itinerary. Well, fun, funny enough is, you know, San Francisco is kind of a big stop along the way, I think, for everyone. And we've stopped in there before. And I know that San Francisco works with people, but I fell in love with learning. I talked to San Mateo County, which is what the county is that San Francisco is in. And it's actually the whole Silicon Valley, you know, kind of down to San Jose area. It's a bit of kind of that peninsula mm-hmm. island area. And And they said they have 30 miles of bay line and 60 miles of coastline. And I just really fell in love with talking to them. And so I'm actually hoping to work with them on a, 
you know, maybe summertime-ish trip or, you know, before fall gets too, too busy and, you know, kind of go there and just see everything there is to do, just not just in, you know, San Francisco proper, but all around that region. Because I think especially for traveling families, you know, you can hit a little bit of the city, but if you're really doing a big vacation there, you might want to get out a little bit. So I fell in love with talking to them and thinking through that. And then the Central Coast, I'm really excited to talk to them and work with them all the way, you know, once you get past San Francisco, before you get into LA, that whole set of coastline. I mean, I know from just projects I've done and being down there before that it's absolutely beautiful. And I know you've done that little route. So, you know, talking to them and figuring that out and stops along the way, I'm really excited to go into, I think it was Santa Cruz. I'm almost positive. They have a Martinelli's tasting room. So, I mean, can you imagine kids on a road trip? You're in this wine region, but there's a Martinelli's like, you know, apple ciders. I'm assuming most people know Martinelli's, but my girls, you know, we have bottles of that from Thanksgiving through New Year's in our fridge all the time. So I'm excited to take that stop along the way. Okay. I'm glad you told me that what that was because as an East Coaster, I didn't know. (laughs) Oh, I know. I think I'm spoiled because I, yeah, I grew up with it in Kansas, but yeah, I think it is a West Coast company. So I was like, Giardelli? Chocolate? <laughs> Giardelli, yeah, that's San Francisco, yeah. <laughs> yeah I was man. chatting with the Central Coast folks also, and one of the things we were thinking about doing possibly this summer or maybe in the fall is like a car-free vacation because we d- we've we actually done San Francisco down to Cambria. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so we hit, you know, Monterey and Big Sur and, you know, a lot of stops along the way. But I haven't done like the Santa Barbara and more of the San Luis Obispo uh, mm-hmm. part. So uh, she was saying like you could fly into LAX and then take like an Amtrak. Yeah. We were just talking about Amtrak, kind of like place to place and then do, you know, like some wine tours and things and or tasting rooms that are in towns, yep. you know, from there. So I thought that sounded like a neat idea too. So we just, Glenn and I have to figure out when we might be able to to do something like that. But yeah, I think that sounds great. And, you know, we talked to Paso Robles and they were saying that it's a town where you it, it's more it's more friendly for, you know, tasting your way around, it sounds like versus, you know, Napa, where it can yeah. get quite crowded and, you know, two streets in and out and you get, you know kind of bottlenecked so and it can that be was kind of yeah bit. a little yeah, yeah and there's we just so to, many great 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 wine regions popping up all around there yeah when we went to Paso Robles which is another region I definitely want to go back to because we really love the wines you know we found we found a lot of family friendly wineries but when I chatted with him he was definitely saying it's the kind of destination where now you can still get to chat with the winemaker whereas others you know are just more commercial or just bigger they don't you don't have that opportunity yeah. And I was like, oh, so you, and he's like, this is like on the cusp, you know, of, <laughs> of becoming like the next Napa kind of thing. And so I'm like, oh, so you're saying like, I should have bought a house there a long time ago. Cause when Glenn and I were out there a couple of years ago, he was like, can we retire here? So <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. You probably missed that window. <laughs> you missed that window. <laughs> yeah. 10 go, 10 years ago, you would have been golden. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So I talked to them and I'm just really excited about that trip now. It has me. You know, of course, I always want more and more time. So now I'm secretly going, I wonder if I could just have the girls skip that Friday before (laughs) spring break. It's already early release. You know, come on, let's just start our vacation early. But I'm excited for that. And then I spoke with some of the cruise lines, you know, like Norwegian and Royal Caribbean and Carnival. So excited, hopefully, about continuing to increase my cruise coverage in the coming year. And of course, then I spoke with Visit Seattle and uh, British Columbia a few places. So, you know, definitely West Coast heavy for me. But what about you? What did you who did you meet with or what were you excited about? Well, I met with a few destinations in Canada. Winnipeg, for example, Um, they have some really great family. It's a good family destination, but I'm kind of interested in going there in the winter, actually, because they have a festival, which sounds a lot, not a lot like, but you know, I'm just thinking of how much we enjoyed the Quebec carnival a a few years ago and, and really enjoyed kind of embracing winter in that way. So I thought that would be fun. And the other part that really surprised me was I met with Northern Ontario, which is like Thunder Bay area. Mm. And wow, like she she just sold it. Like First of all, like <laughs> some people are just so passionate and energetic about their destination. But, you know, it seems like this 
beautiful uh, scenic drive that, you know, everyone thinks of things like Highway 1 in California, but yeah. then they can get, you know, kind of crowded. So I'm like, oh, interesting. So, you know, we I chatted with her too, and I didn't get to meet with like Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. That's where I was thinking of maybe going um, also this summer. But, you know, I still have a lot of time open this summer. So I was just there to kind of get some ideas. I mean, I did chat with Maine and Florida Keys and Missouri. Yeah. Like I definitely want to go back <laughs> and visit some of the destinations that I've already done, but in a little bit deeper way and get to see a little bit more of the off the beaten path. And I want to schedule a, a road trip with you. Yeah, yes. that'll be great if that girlfriend's getaway to the Florida Keys works out, because I think that's the perfect kind of destination for that. And, you know, I did just see that article shared across Facebook that says, you know, moms need to plan momcations that we're actually, it's good mm-hmm. for our, our mental health. So we already know knew that, but I've if- been trying to think <laughs> of like, what is the right word for that? Right. Cause I'm yeah. like a mom break, but then I'm like, well, that just sounds like we're like desperate. you need a break from your kids. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No yeah. momcation. I think that's a good one. Okay. <laughs> Although I think girls trip or girlfriend getaway works too, because that's part of what it is, right? We get so busy or we're just, even our friends and moms that are in town with us, it seems like we're just talking about, you know, carpools or logistical stuff. And so it's nice to just talk about I mean, food or what we're live, along the way. You live across the country and I chat with you more than I chat with my <laughs> friend that lives up the street. So I think that's you know, the same. It's so hard to make time for yourself um, with all the kids activities. And I will say to, to parents that have young children, it just gets worse. Like you really don't have more time as they get older. You have less time. So yeah. Start that those traditions now. Keep them strong. The nice thing about as your kids get older, it's easier for you to get away maybe sometimes on um, getaways, but you have to have a partner who then can step up to the plate and, you know, manage all the logistical stuff then depending on what your current work schedule and partnership schedule looks like. So, yeah. Uh, and you have to have a friend that can do the same, right? Because yeah. sometimes that's my challenge. Like I remember my college friends and I used to try to do a weekend away every year. Um, but it got harder and harder because a lot of them have like four kids, yeah. you know, and just yeah. became and coordination. impossible. Yeah, coordinating mm-hmm. that is just tough. I know that it's kind of nice when we have, you know, my mom lives in town, so that's a huge help. But also as the girls have gotten older, it's kind of easy when you have teens that they can go over to a friend's house and the parents don't really mind because it's not really like take, they somehow manage to feed themselves and get themselves off to school and stuff. So it works out kind of nice. Yeah, I'm very thankful for the parents of one of Hannah's friends that will sometimes have her sleepover uh, even during the week when yeah. Glenn and I have overlapping travel. Yeah. Um, so that's been very helpful. It's a big lifesaver. Yeah. And if you do want to hear where Kim and I wind up, make sure that you subscribe to our podcast. I know a lot of times people will find us on iTunes and maybe find just one episode and not realize that you can subscribe. But if you go to the podcast listing on the Apple podcast app or any of your podcast apps, usually right up by the description, there's a button that says subscribe, sometimes it has a plus sign on it. So if you just hit subscribe, you'll get to hear from us every week. But in the meantime, we're going to be chatting all about Greece. So let's get to our interview. So this week we're chatting with Dawn Nicholson. She is the Canadian mom who loves blogging about her adventures traveling with kids and expat life at Five Lost Together. She eats, sleeps, and breathes travel and wants to inspire other families to take epic trips with their kids. So welcome, Dawn. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're happy to find somebody that we can talk to about Greece because uh, I know it's kind of a hot destination. But before we jump into that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your family? I mean, we can imply some things because you have five lost together (laughs) and we know you're from Canada, but tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, we actually just moved back to Canada. We spent the last two years living in Melbourne, Australia. So we came back in September and actually our travels to Greece this past summer was um, on route between uh, Australia as we transitioned back to life in Canada. Canada. So we've lived overseas a couple of times. We've also lived in Malaysia as well. Um, obviously love to travel and there is five of us. So my husband, Paul and I, and the kids are 11, nine and seven. Um, we do have traditional jobs and um, 
kind of try to fit travel in whenever we can. And that's why we love expat life because it allows us to kind of travel a lot more in a, in a new region. Um, I'm a teacher traditionally, so um, that's what I do. And my husband's an engineer and he does have some flexibility in his job. He can work remotely here and there. Um, but for the most part, he does have a traditional job. In terms of kind of the travel bug for me, I think I really got the travel bug when I was about 14. My family uh, took a year out and went sailing from Canada down to the Caribbean. Uh, And that had a huge, yeah, huge impact on me. It showed me different ways of living your life, uh, different styles of travel. Um, So that was when I was 14. And um, yeah, we like to travel any way we can. So I mentioned we've lived overseas a couple times. We lived on a sailboat for six months. And then we've done lots of kind of trips in the one to three month range. And generally our trips tend to be budget focused and, you know, active adventure travel. Yeah, well, that's lucky. I, I'm so jealous of people that get to live overseas, but especially in like the Australia or Asia area, because it just seems so easy to get everywhere, you know, from there. So yeah, and cheaper no, exactly. flights, right? Yeah, well, and especially in Asia, right? Like the cost of living is so cheap. And yeah, you can get to so many countries and, you know, yeah, short flight. That's great. So you said that you were just in Greece for this past summer. So do you, you know, what kind of led you guys to decide to take a family vacation to Greece? Yeah, so we were traveling for two months as we moved back to Canada, and we were going to spend most of our time in Asia because we just find our money goes a lot further in Asia. But my daughter, really, she's 11, and she is always kind of wanting to spend more time in Europe. Um, she spent a lot of time traveling in Asia, and she really would like us to see us travel a bit more in Europe. And she had read um, the Percy Jackson books by Rick Riordan and had become really interested in Greek mythology, really interested in Greece. So so I, when I, I kind of saw that there was a way for us as we moved from Asia to North America that we could actually, in fact, fly via Greece. And so as soon as I saw that as an option, I thought, wow, this is a great way to incorporate something she's really, really interested and passionate about. And none of us had been to Greece before. So, you know, it was a great way for all of us to get a taste of Greece. So this was one of our first trips that was really driven by um, a destination that the kids wanted to go to. And so We were in Greece for about 10 days, and the focus really was on exploring places that Ella had read about in the uh, Percy Jackson series. That's so awesome. I I have a a reader, too, and so she's... You know, she's read all of those books back in the day. And, you know, I like that they're based in like a lot of different places, like they spur the mythology interest. But then there's scenes that are like in New York and scenes in, well, it depends on which trilogy or or which series, I guess, but in London. So I just love that you've incorporated that. That's so cool. Yeah. And and now they have um, like he has series now in all different parts of the world. Like I know there's a, a Norse mythology series. Yeah. Um, and there's this Rick Riordan presents where he has other authors that are writing kind of in the mythology genre. Um, so I know she, we're going to Mexico soon and she read one on Mayan mythology. So, yeah, she has just gone 100 percent into kind of mythology. And I when we were there, I was I'm so impressed with what she knows, like knows about it. I know nothing about Greek mythology. Um, yeah. And it's impressive to see what she's learned from those books. That's fantastic. So you went to Athens and you spent some time like on the mainland. If someone is, is going to take a similar trip, would you recommend 10 days? Do you think that that's enough or do you think that you would, you would, do you wish that you would have extended it longer and that you would do more? say probably two weeks would be an opti- optimal amount. Um, 10, 10 days was a little bit short. We could have done with a little bit extra time, but certainly 10 days was a good introduction to the country. Uh, we didn't go to the Greek islands at all, so we were just focused on, we did a few days in Athens and then we did uh, about a one week road trip on the Peloponnese, which is kind of a, a piece of land just west of Athens. But if you were planning to do the Greek islands as well, I would think you definitely would want to have two weeks to explore the area. Um, but yeah, for us, 10 days you know, it worked pretty well. I wonder, I'm thinking of all, you know, the families that only have a week vacation. I wonder if, (laughs) you know, maybe they could make it where do one week just mainly around the Athens and some of the mainland area. And then a different week would be visiting the islands, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think you wouldn't want to do both in one trip. If you had only a week, I think you could definitely do Athens. And then there's actually quite a few of the kind of Greek mythology sites fairly close to Athens. So you could do a few days road trip doing that in a week. You definitely could. In fact, there's companies right now that run Percy Jackson themed uh, like multi-day tours and they do them in a week. Um, We, Mike, uh, Ella really wanted to go to Olympia uh, where the, um, you know, birthplace of the Olympic Games. And that's a little bit further out. And so if you weren't going to Olympia, 
media, I think you could see a lot of the main sites in a week. That's good. And what about time of year? You sounds like you went in the summer, which I imagine yeah. is fairly busy and maybe kind of hot too. What do you think is a good time to visit? Yeah, we went in August and I wouldn't have chosen that. Um, it just like it happened to coincide with when we were traveling and when we had to go, but I wouldn't choose that. It was really, really hot, incredibly hot. And so you're visiting a lot of these, um, you know, archaeological sites. Uh, there's not a lot of trees around. It's really, really hot. Um, not to mention, obviously, it's crowded. It's peak season. And so your costs are higher, too, because, you know, it's peak season. So I, you know, I probably would recommend like May, June or September and October, which they probably call I don't even know if that's shoulder season, but moving more into shoulder season because it would still be warm, which is nice. Um, but I think budget wise, your money would go a little bit further and then you don't have to deal with that heat. And I mean, if you are really on a budget, I've seen people do uh, Greece trips, you know, in the middle of the winter. And that works out really well because you can get incredible deals on accommodation if you go in the winter time and you don't mind. You know, it's still not that cold compared to places like Canada. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's a good option for people too. Yeah, I was going to say, we've looked at it for like a March break, but we've wanted to combine it with the islands, which right. so you kind of need to be in the summer. But if you were just doing the mainland, I would think that, you know, a spring break possibility would work. Yeah, if you're just interested in kind of the more the history and the culture. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, any of the fall, winter, or spring would work really well. Because I imagine that heat, I've been to like Pompeii in the hot, you know, the heat of summer when the there's no shade and you're just walking around like yep. ruins and oh it's it's brutal so yeah it's hard to keep the kids motivated to you know keep sightseeing when yeah it's super hot and you know you try to start your days early and do it in the mornings but yeah cool and you guys said you spent how many days in Athens so we were in Athens for three days okay and is that you think that's probably pretty good yeah, again, I mean, I think you could you could do two days there and you'd get a good taste of Athens. Uh, three days, I felt like, was a really good amount of time for us. We saw kind of all the major things that we wanted to see. Um, but again, it's a it's a cool city, too. You could spend, I know there's people who've spent, you know, a week there. And yeah, there's definitely lots, to think, lots of things to do because it is a major city. Awesome. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, people can kind of take it where they want, but it's good to know that you could, you know, see some good sites still in a two or three day part to just know how to break things up. So that's great. So if people are planning to visit Athens, what do you think are maybe like the top five things they should definitely see on a visit to Athens, Greece? Well, the top one I think that everybody has to see is the Acropolis mm -hmm. and the Parthenon up there. Um, you know, it's in the center of the city, um, you know, probably Greece's most important historical site. Um, so definitely have to do that. And I think if you do that with a guide, you definitely get more out of it than if you just, I mean, you can go up by yourself, obviously. But um, if you have a guide, you get a lot more out of it. At the bottom of the Acropolis, there's a really, it's a fairly new museum. And I know sometimes we're scared to go to museums with kids, but it's a fantastic museum. I know our kids, as soon as they walked in, they had like Lego and miniature models of the um, Acropolis and other, you know, other main sites and buildings. Um, and they were, of course, interested in that. And they had like good little scavenger hunt activities through the museum to get the kids involved. Uh, and it has beautiful views of the Acropolis, too. So the museum is really, really good for kids. Um, I think all of us know Greek food is amazing. So mm -hmm. to me, when you visit Athens, you have to do something with the food. There's markets you can visit. We actually did a food tour. And um, this is our first year doing food tours. We did a couple last year. And we love how they combine, like, you know, you learn about the culture. Um, and often you're doing, like, some type of walking tour. But you're also getting to taste all these amazing different things. And you get to taste things that maybe we all think of, you know, olives and spanakopita when we think of Greek food. Um, but it's interesting to taste kind of more like local food. So think we tasted things like sardines, which is not something I would normally probably pick and eat. Mm -hmm. And um, this bread that's shaped in a circle called kalori. Um, so, you know, it was neat to taste those different things and to just spend time with a local was cool, too. So that's one. Another fun thing I think that a lot of kids would like and my kids were interested in is a changing of the guard. So it's very different from the ones that you experience in England, but it's full of pomp and, you know, they've got these really elaborate costumes and that happens every hour at uh, Syntagma. And so you can go and see that. And that's, you know, it's only a 20 minute thing, but it's really neat to see. 
Um, another thing is just kind of walking around the Athens. The main sites are fairly um, concentrated. Like, it's pretty easy to get around to them. So there's uh, the Plaka is a really touristy area. It's beautiful kind of streets and there's cafes everywhere. And so you can walk around um, and just get a feel for the town. We really like, like, using the Rick Steves audio guide tours. I don't know if you've used those before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to give us a little bit more information as we're walking around about what we're seeing. I think I'm almost, there's one other thing that I would really recommend, and I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but Athens is fairly flat, but then there's this hill called Mount Lycabetus, maybe? I'm <laughs> not sure how it's said. Um, and you take a funicular up there, and it has beautiful views over Athens. And so that's, you know, kids like, I know my kids like different types of transportation. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was cool, and there was a really nice view. Um, so that was the fun thing to do as well. That sounds like a really fun mix. Now, the changing of the guard that you mentioned, is that in front of like a presidential <laughs> palace or what is that in front of? Yes, I should know exactly what it's in front of. Um, but yeah, some type of kind of, yeah, presidential palace. And it's right in the main square, which you might have heard about when Greece was having a lot of demonstrations. It's kind mm-hmm. of the, the political square there where a lot of the demonstrations happened. And yeah, there's some type of government building there. And they do that changing of the guard every hour. I think they do a more elaborate one at like maybe 11 or something. But we saw just the regular hourly one. Um, yeah, and two guards get replaced by the other two guards. And they really do this almost it's like a dance and they've got these very funny costumes with pointy shoes and stuff. So, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, it sounds like a good mix to keep the kids engaged. Uh, I love that you did a food tour, too. I mean, I'm a huge fan of food tours, but people always feel like, oh, if your kids are too young, like they won't um, enjoy it, it'll be boring or they'll be picky. Um, But your kids are fairly young, and and did they, they enjoyed it? Yeah, no, they definitely did. Um, My kids love to eat. Um, And they're at an age now, like, so the youngest is seven, so he can walk a decent distance. Because, you know, often food tours do cover, you know, a a fair bit of ground. So he can definitely keep up. My kids are fairly good eaters. Like, they are, and they're willing to try different things. But what I liked about this food tour company, um, it's called Athens Food on Foot, is that they um, actually have a family tour. So she then designs stops that, you know, kids are going to kind of be interested in. So one of the last stops that we stopped at, it's probably not like a huge traditional Greek thing, but it's this um, ice cream that they make in front of you. So they mix up all the ingredients and then they put it on this kind of metal thing that freezes it right in front of the kids. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Like they thought that was amazing. Right. So uh, a traditional tour wouldn't wouldn't do that. But the kids focus tours, um, you know, incorporate some foods that kids really would like. So, yeah, that's what I really liked. And they also had, like, we're vegetarians as well. So I really liked that she was still able to customize the tour and we were still able to, you know, sample lots of different things. You know, because sometimes as vegetarians, you feel like, oh, I don't know if I can do a food tour. Um, yeah. Will it be too restricted? But I think a lot of the food tour companies now, you know, they, they're they customizing them to kind of different food tastes and including for families. That's really great. Was it private then or was it just a group with just families? It was a group. Like it, it would normally be a group one, but we happened to be the only family there on that day. So, yeah. Sometimes that's a nice thing, especially if you're, I mean, you're not a large family, but you know, if you, if, if there's only eight spots and you take up five of them, you may, you know, you'd get a family like mine to go with you, but sometimes you end up with your own tour, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, it worked out really, really nicely. And the kids were, yeah, they were totally into it. And I couldn't believe like how they could answer the questions and they remembered, you know, what she had said about different things. And, um, and yeah, we really did try some foods that we wouldn't have normally, which is, which I think is awesome. When you guys were done exploring Athens and all those great things, you said you took a little road trip. So where did you head then from there? Um, So, yeah, we picked up our our rental car and we headed out to the Peloponnese. And uh, my daughter had kind of gone through with me some of the sites that she was most interested in visiting. And I had gone on, like I said, there are some companies that actually will organize your trip for you. We wanted um, more of a do-it-yourself kind of trip. But I had gotten some ideas from those websites as well about what were some of the main kind of Percy Jackson sites. So we headed out and we first went, you first crossed the Corinth Canal, which you might have heard about it. It's a real cool engineering marvel where they dug through and created this very narrow canal so that ships could go through instead of having to go around this big chunk of land. And so that was cool for the kids. And I mean, they bungee jump, not the kids, but um, people can bungee jump off it. So, of course, we had to stop and watch some of the bungee jumping. So then we headed to a really cute 
or a really cute town called Naflio. And again, I'm not sure about my pronunciation on all these Greek uh, places, uh, but this was a super cute little fishing village and I'd heard amazing things about it. And it's a really great base for exploring the Peloponnese. So we actually stayed there a couple nights because this trip was a pretty short trip. So, you know, one night stays, you know, with families can be really, really tiring. So we yeah. did stay a couple nights there, which was really nice. And it was full of lots of Greek and European tourists, not very many international tourists. I think in the summer, a lot of the international tourists are going to the islands. So this was a lot of like Greek families and maybe some other European families. So that was really neat. You felt like you were a little more off, like off the beaten path. And it's a really cute town. We stopped at one of the major sites it's called Epidavris. And it's this huge, uh, not a stadium, it's a theater. Um, and it's almost all intact. And they still actually put on shows there. And that was an amazing site. And so we also did some touring of the beaches around that area because they've got lots of cute little fishing towns, um, you know, stopped and would have, you know, a lovely lunch, right, you know, two feet from the ocean. So we did do some beach time as well because we had the, fo- the trip was very focused on culture and history. But of course, we wanted to enjoy the kind of the beaches as well. And then from there, we headed uh, towards Olympia, uh, so the birthplace of the modern Olympic Games, and that was somewhere my daughter really, really wanted to go. There's not actually that much left at that site um, in terms of where, you know, the first races were. It's mostly just a a kind of a green area with a little bit of seating that's left, but it still felt really, really surreal to kind of think about those athletes and compare that to what we watch nowadays. And even just to hear things like, I didn't realize like women couldn't participate, they couldn't even watch as spectators the ancient game so you know little things like that were really interesting to hear and of course the kids had to have a little foot race uh running on that field you know and pretending they were olympians and uh, we did some other just little um, activities, like we visited a honey farm and learned all about how honey is produced. And that was really interesting. And they had lots of cute little, I loved eating in Greece. Like we came home from Greece and we were just like, oh, the food, it really, truly was amazing. Like we never had a bad meal. Prices were incredibly reasonable. You know, we'd often just order lots of different little dishes and share together as a family. You know, everything tasted so fresh. And uh, so yeah, I certainly looked forward to every meal that we had while we were in Greece. And then from Olympia, we crossed back over to the mainland and visited Delphi, which is one of the most important um, kind of Greek sites. And I'm not sure how familiar you are you are with Greek history, but there's, there was an oracle um, at Delphi and uh, people would come and visit this oracle and it features heavily in the Percy Jackson books as well. So we visited and it's a gorgeous uh, archaeological site built up inside of the mountains, gorgeous views back over the coast. And uh, there's also at all of these sites, they have museums. So, you know, you can also see lots of the artifacts um, as well. And then from there, we headed back towards Athens um, and we stopped. We actually passed Athens and went down to just the southern tip of where Athens is. And it's called Sunio. And there's the Temple of Poseidon, uh, which is this temple built on a um, a little hill overlooking the ocean. And again, it features heavily in the books. And that was somewhere my daughter really wanted to go as well. So I guess actually we were only five days on the road. um, So it was fairly quick moving around. And certainly if you only had a few, like three days, you could could do a three-day trip, certainly if you didn't uh, visit Olympia, which is a bit farther out. I really love that mix of activities. Like, it's gotten me excited about it because I keep getting frustrated with when to go to Greece. Because like I said, we have a spring break in March. It's a little chilly. And then summer, you know, I see those pictures of the crowds on Mykonos. And I'm like, there's no way. I just don't want to deal with that. You know, and I know that you can go to some of the quieter islands, but it just seems so overwhelming. But just to hear that you actually got to explore, like, fishing villages and beaches where you were, I imagine it wasn't. Was it not as crowded maybe as, I mean, I know you don't have it it to compare to. Yeah, it didn't feel that crowded at all. And yeah, I didn't feel like there was swarms of tourists or anything. I mean, there are tour buses that will, you know, visit a lot of these major sites. And it was always nice if you arrived, you know, before about 10 or 11 when they were kind of all rolling in. But even when the tour buses were there, I didn't feel, you know, it didn't really take away. I didn't feel like, you know, we were in crowds and throngs of people. So, yeah, that might be because we did choose kind of a slightly different destination compared to, you know, I think most people do stick to the Greek islands, especially in the summer. Yeah. So do you have any tips for our listeners about, you know, what families should be prepared for when they visit Greece? You know, maybe talking about the language, money, tipping, you know, getting around any, you know, tips for that sort of thing? 
Um, well, first of all, we found like the hospitality was incredible. Like we've traveled in lots of parts of the world and I mean, Greek hospi- hospitality, I think it has a, you know, we think of it as being good, but it was a phenomenal. Like we stayed in an Airbnb in Athens and our host there was actually the parents of the person who owned the apartment. And uh, they greeted us with, they had grapes and cookies for the kids and, you know, big hugs for us. You know, we hadn't met them mm-hmm. before and big hugs. And so exactly what you think of with Greek hospitality, we totally encountered everywhere we went people were incredibly friendly I mean obviously especially to children but even just to us they were really really friendly so I mean that's that was really nice Uh, We did rent a car um, for that road trip portion. And, you know, we found that a bit confusing, renting a car there. Um, They do, they have a lot of smaller independent Greek car rental companies. So, you know, we were a little hesitant about booking through one of those, but it worked out really well. It was, we did find it fairly expensive to rent a car. um, But obviously, you know, it was great having uh, the independence to be able to get around. And when there is five of us, you know, when you compare public transit, renting a car certainly doesn't seem so bad. There are quite a bit of toll roads that we were I didn't really know about when we went there like you will drive like 10 kilometers and you have to pay a toll and it's all cash Uh, we're used to in Canada you know pictures of the license plate but in Greece you have to have lots of change ready Um, and like every 10 kilometers you have to pay more it felt like and I mean it wasn't um, you know crazy expensive but it did add up after a while I think we went over one bridge uh, a very long big bridge and the toll was like 28 euros we were like oh my goodness yeah but it's this very fancy bridge that was very expensive I guess for them to build and I'm like that's worse than like the GW bridge in New York City <laughs> it was crazy because it was funny because as we approached the bridge we saw like this ferry going back and forth like a car ferry and we're like why would anyone take a car ferry when there's a bridge <laughs> and then after we got over and we had to pay our toll I said okay now I get why people would take the ferry because it's cheaper I guess than driving across on the bridge tipping um we didn't find that tipping was customary there I mean we would round up our bills of a couple of euros but um mm-hmm you know not a lot of tipping we found the portions were really large like the first few days we always over ordered because yeah the main course is like huge so um, you only need a couple of main dishes for a family of five Um, and like I said I liked just ordering a bunch of different dishes and then everybody sharing it was a good country I thought for vegetarians lots of different choices especially if you do eat fish obviously because there's lots of fish and seafood but the food was very very reasonably priced like even a carafe of wine was 350 euros which you know wow wow of house wine in Athens we I think if people are going with younger kids I don't know if I would use a stroller you know they have like so many parts of Europe, lots of cobblestone streets. Um, So, you know, I think a carrier would be better. You have to be careful with taxis in Athens. We had a couple rip-off situations where we got taken advantage of with taxis. We usually try to take uh, public transit, but from the airport, we took a taxi, and they have this rule where they will not take more than four people. So because we're five people, they basically try to rip you off, and they'll say, well, I'll take you, but you have to pay this amount. So we had that happen to us a couple of times, or they'd try to convince us we needed to take two taxis, which, you know, just cost-wise was more expensive, not to mention, you know, we didn't want to split up. And then one time we kind of agreed on a price with the taxi and then we got there and my husband gave him, I think it was 40 euros and he gave him a 50 and the guy was like, no, no, no change for you because there's five of you and I'm not supposed to take five of you. And so I risked, Uh, you know, so he wouldn't give us any change. So, you know, there were a couple moments. So they do have meters on the taxi. So just make sure the driver is using the meter. If there's no meter, you know, I would get out of the taxi and you have to be careful if you're a family, a larger family, like a five or six. Well, in terms of language, we found, you know, no problem. Uh, even in, you know, the smaller communities, most people had to, you know, base, a, a basic English that you could get through a conversation. So we didn't have any problem with that. For budget travelers, you know, I think a good tip is you can buy souvlaki on the street for about 250 euros a person. Um, so that's a really good cheap lunch if you're looking to save money. And basically, most restaurants that serve souvlaki will have like, you know, their main sit down area, but then they'll have a little window where they sell takeout souvlaki to go for 250 euros. And if you sat down, you know, it might be like 10 or 12 euros. Mm. Um, so certainly look for those takeout ones. And we found that was a good way to have lunch. So those are some tips, I think. Those are great tips. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like good. now, yeah. And it's, I also love your tip about like looking at a tour company's itinerary to get ideas. Mm-hmm. We've mentioned that in other episodes and it's just it's just such a good thing for people to keep in mind. Like you can do it yourself. There are resources out there. 
you know, it's nice to get those ideas because they've clearly taken the time to scope it all out, you know? Yeah, I do it all the time. Like we're going to Mexico next month. And so one of the first things I do when I'm doing uh, research is, yeah, I look up one of those like intrepid uh, companies mm-hmm. that do organized tours. And yeah, I want to just get an idea of what are the big stops that, you know, they they stop on? What does a route kind of look like? And how much time do they spend everywhere? And yeah, that's always my starting point. Great. So did you use just like Google Maps to get around the cities and to when you were driving and stuff? Or did you have any other apps that you would recommend? And, you know, was Uber even an option there? Do you know what? I don't actually know if Uber was an option. We didn't use it there. Um, we just, we had a SIM card um, in our phone. So we just used Google Maps to get around. Yeah, that made, that was, you know, it wasn't too hard to get around. Uh, the driving's slightly different, I would say, than Western Europe. There's a little bit more, you know, people kind of, I guess, less following of rules in some mm-hmm. cases. But mm-hmm. overall, it was, you know, fairly easy to drive there. Great. Well, I wanted to ask one of the questions that we ask all of our guests, and that is, what do you wear when you travel? All right. We are, we're fairly, we just kind of travel with whatever we have. So we don't have too many items that I would say are must have things that I wear, but there is a a travel dress that I absolutely love. I actually just bought a second one the other day and it's made by Toad and Company. I don't know if that's North American or, and it's called the Rosemary dress. And it's just like a really flattering, you know, short sleeve cotton dress. And I have a black one. So, you know, you can wear it hiking, you can wear it, you know, if you're getting a little bit more dressed up. Um, so yeah, that's Toting Company Rosemary dress. I really like that one. Our kids, we always travel with keen sandals. Uh, we don't often travel with running shoes if we're going to a fairly warm weather destination. Um, I like keens because they can still hike in them and they still provide lots of support, but they're a little bit more lightweight. My husband is very particular about travel shorts that he wears. He has a thing about pockets. He needs to have certain pockets to keep, like a cell phone and wallet and all those things. So he really likes these Quicksilver Waterman shorts um, because they have zippered pockets, which is something that's really important to him. I always travel with a scarf. I just find, you know, if you're cold, if you need to cover up in a more uh, traditional culture, that's a great thing to have. And so I always have a scarf. And, oh, my husband has now discovered, I don't know if you've ever heard of these beneath underwear for men. Have you guys heard of that? No. Okay, again, maybe, I'm not sure. I I think they started out maybe as being Canadian, but they're quite popular everywhere here now. So they're these really lightweight kind of athletic underwear, so they dry quickly for men, and they've kind of got, oh, it sounds terrible to say, but I call it like a bra for their (laughs) <laughs> their stuff and my husband finds them incredibly comfortable and they are quick drying and they're just like amazing underwear I bought him one to try and he like that night ordered like a whole set online he was like sold on them so nice. yeah those are some of the different kind of I guess items that we do love that's hysterical awesome. great so do you want to maybe share with our listeners if you have any upcoming vacations I know that you know as you're approaching the end of the school year maybe and then also let our listeners know where they can find you online Yeah, so we actually just got back from, we were out in the Canadian Rockies. My brother lives out there. So we just had an awesome winter wonderland, uh, skiing, snowshoeing holiday that we just got back from. Um, I am teaching right now. So we're a little more limited to school holidays, but I'm actually taking a five month leave of absence starting next month. So we have a three month trip coming up. And so we're going to be going, they're very random countries, but we're going to be going to Mexico, India, and then Nepal. So that's really exciting. And we have very little of it planned. Uh, we've mm-hmm. literally booked like a flight there. I've booked five nights accommodation for the whole three months. That's it. Um, <laughs> so we're going to have to figure it out as we go. But we kind of like that to keep things fairly flexible. Um, so, yeah, we're excited about that trip. And um, I do blog at fivelosttogether.com. So that's the number five, losttogether.com. And then we also share lots of photos and other interesting travel things on our Instagram and Facebook pages, which are both at Five Lost Together. Perfect. Well, like at least you're, thing, yeah. At least you're in uh, India and Nepal are near each other. I mean, they're not totally <laughs> random. But. Well, I did think I was like, she's in Canada and she's going to Mexico and then to India. Like, when, are you going back from Mexico to Canada to fly to India? Or are you flying to India from? No, we fly. We go to LA and then we'll fly from Mexico to LA and then LA to India. Okay. We started with like full three months. We were going to do an Asia and we were going to go to the Philippines. And then we were like, we have not spent enough time in Mexico um, as you know Canadians, and it's so close to us. So, and we've had really busy like adjusting back to life in Canada and. Um, 
you know, it's just been a busy year. So we're like, we need somewhere to just decompress for a bit. So we're like, we'll go to Mexico first, you know, lots of beach time, relaxing, and then take on kind of more the active India, Nepal later on. So yeah, it's actually tricky trying to pack for those because we've got a few different climates. So I'm trying to figure that all out right now. <laughs> That's always nice. hard. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I, I mean, I'm really excited listening to the details of your trip. Now I'm going to go and uh, read all of your articles in more depth and we will link to those in the show notes too. If, if people are looking for a little bit more detail of exactly where you went, what you did, where you stayed, that kind of thing. So thank you. I really appreciate sharing with us. Yeah, no, thank you. I think, yeah, Greece offers a lot for families. And if uh, families are interested in Percy Jackson, then there's that natural link there. And you can either do it yourself like we did it, or there are organized tours that you can do for a week. Or even if you're just in Athens and you want to do a Percy Jackson Athens tour for a day, they have day trips like that too. So uh, it's a great trip for kids. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Don, for your time. No problem. As always, thanks for joining us for another week here at Vacation Mavens. And please help us out by hitting that subscribe button so that you stay up to date on everywhere new we're talking about. And next week, we are going to be chatting all about the bucket list destination of Antarctica. So we hope you'll join us then. Chat with you soon. 